Douglas Murray writes as a modern-day Jeremiah, a prophet of doom, and in the elegiac mode. The prose is flecked through with tragedy, lament, and a sense of profound loss. While this semi-apocalyptic register seems dramatic at first, as an overall rhetorical strategy, it is quite effective. Those who already agree with him may be driven to anger and despair by this book. Those who don't might at least be driven to think. All but the most ardent of ideologues, who are already beyond any hope of redemption, need to reflect on what he says. The Strange Death of Europe is a book for this political moment, taking stock of what has gone wrong with Western notions of multiculturalism, a story to which so many of us were blind until the historic Brexit and Trump votes of 2016. This is not a tub-thumping nativist argument against immigration, but rather a deeply philosophical and sensitive treatment of how this issue has been dealt with in our politics and culture. When I say our, I mostly mean us in Europe, although there are surely dozens of lessons here for readers in North America and Australia too. There are three broad but interconnected phases to the book, which I'll comment on in turn. Number one, how immigration became a crisis in Europe. Number two, issues around white guilt and the feeling that Europe is tired. And third, the loss of cultural values as Europe became more secular and globalized. So first on immigration itself, Murray does an excellent job here on both raw numbers and statistics. A particularly effective strategy is how he contrasts the forecasts made uh, both by proponents of immigration and by those who were demonized by such proponents, such as the conservative MP Enoch Powell, famous for his Rivers of Blood speech, and the actual reality of what happened. So, as Murray points out, if anyone had suggested to Powell in 1968 that he should use his Birmingham speech to predict that within the lifespan of most people listening, those who identified as white British would be a minority in their capital city, he would have dismissed such an advisor as a maniac. As was the case in each of the other European countries, even the most famous prophet of immigration doom in fact underestimated and understated the case. Another thing he does particularly well is to show how, during every single push for mass immigration, political elites were opposed by their populations at large. At no point between 1960 and the time of writing did the general populace support mass immigration. There are some staggering statistics in the book, not just the one about London being less than 50% white British, but also that one district of Paris is 30% Muslim, with the vast majority of the remainder coming from sub-Saharan Africa. There are 10 mosques in this one zone alone, and it's an area where most Parisians now dare not venture. Similar stories can be seen across France and indeed most of Europe, especially in Germany and Sweden. The extraordinary year of 2015 in which Angela Merkel more or less opened the floodgates to undocumented refugees also provides some staggering numbers. Sweden alone took around 180,000 refugees just in 2015, of which 35,000 were children. In the same year, Ingris Lomfors, the head of Sweden's Living History Forum, declared there is no such thing as Swedish culture. From the British perspective, one person who does not come out of this well is Tony Blair's Minister for Asylum and Immigration, Barbara Roach. She seemed to have a utopian vision for mass immigration into this country. She stopped deporting asylum seekers because removal takes too long and it's emotional, and in any case, contemporary restraints on immigration were racist. As one colleague said, Roach didn't see her job as controlling entry into Britain, but by looking at the wider picture in a holistic way, she wants us to see the benefit of a multicultural society. She criticised colleagues for being too white and said, I love diversity in London, I just feel comfortable. In other words, as Murray put it, this was a deliberate policy of societal transformation. A culture war was being waged against the British people, using immigrants as some kind of battering ram. I'd like to put it another way. Roach had a utopian vision, untested by reality, and she was using the British populace as her guinea pigs.
Eastern Europeans living in Britain alone rose from 170,000 in 2004 to 1.24 million in 2013. Up until last year, we were taking 300,000 fresh migrants every year. That's basically a small city's worth of people. Murray exposes how this is routinely sold to the people in terms of the net benefits of migration by using only the best and the brightest who come in as representatives of migration per se. For example, they take your typical educated Spanish person working for a big multinational in London and use that demographic group statistics to fill in for all migrants. One of the most effective chapters in the book is called The Excuses We Told Ourselves, in which Murray counters the usual arguments for migration one by one. The economic benefits, the idea of ageing populations, diversity, and the idea that immigration is unstoppable because of globalisation. Under closer scrutiny, Murray argues, none of these arguments stands up. You seldom even get an honest look at these things on television debates and in newspapers, and it is refreshing at least to hear the counterpoints being articulated in their best possible forms. I will move on now to the second third of the book, which is built around arguably its best chapter, The Tyranny of Guilt. Murray provides a penetrating analysis of the ideas and assumptions around this most pernicious of ideologies, and asks the most sensible possible questions of its advocates, questions that anyone with an ounce of common sense knows cannot be answered by reason. However, the bigger takeaway is that this sense of guilt has eroded European confidence and our ability to stand up for our own principles and to fight those who are attacking them. Even worse, it has eroded our sense of identity as people can no longer be proud of their own histories and nationalities, instead having to champion mascot victim groups in lieu of their own cultures. Murray argues that this endemic guilt is unique in history and must be overturned if the European way of life is to be maintained. He points out that ever great civilizations who have equally bloody histories, the Turks, the Russians, the Chinese and so on, have no such sense of guilt. Although Murray never says it himself, I am reminded of Nietzsche's slave and master moralities. Murray's central thesis is that Europe is now so tired it has not only given up the fight, it is actively committing suicide by inviting people who do not share their values or their culture to take their home from them, the ultimate act of reparation. And so uh, the book moves into its final and perhaps most profound section in which Murray looks at some of the costs of Enlightenment hubris and of the decline of Christianity across Europe. His argument is less that we should all become Christians again, but rather that nothing has replaced the church and in its place toxic and self-defeating ideologies such as those we have been discussing have uh, snuck into the void. The passage on the novels of Michel Hulbeck is especially interesting and at times profound. In closing, I recommend that everyone, regardless of your politics, left, right or centre, read this book because it poses some very serious questions for the road ahead. This is not the sort of issue that is going to go away. It does not matter what happens with Brexit or indeed with the EU itself, the populations left behind have an almighty political, cultural and philosophical challenge ahead of them for the next 20 or 30 years because at the exact moment that Europe and America seem to be so intent on tearing themselves apart with problems largely brought on by themselves, China shows no real signs of slowing down its plans for global domination. We need to educate ourselves as best we can, avail ourselves with the facts, and Murray's provocative intervention in this debate is a fantastic starting point to do this. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank in particular Son of Tiamat, Cult of the Lich, Charles Vincent and Edward Dara. <laughs>